You're listening to The Drag. Have you ever met Miss Lindy? She's a guy with a bright red hair. Now nah, she stands out from Texarkana isn't like the rest of Texas. It sits on the border of both Texas and Arkansas. You can travel between the two states in a matter of minutes. And there are actually two Texarkanas. One on the Texas side and one on the Arkansas side. There are tall, lush pine trees everywhere. If you're on a road trip, this is probably where you'd make a pit stop. There are gas stations, lots of fast food chains, and a few Walmarts. It has everything you need, but maybe not everything you want. I know, because I grew up there. The summers are hot and muggy, and winters can be fairly frigid, or surprisingly mild. On a February night in 1946, the weather was pleasant and in the upper 60s when a serial killer stalked his first victims in Texarkana. Nineteen forties Texarkana consisted mostly of dirt roads, farmlands, and lots and lots of trees. Well, uh, I think the total population of both sides of town probably amounted to something around thirty thousand, and now it's uh, the city itself is, I believe, sixty something thousand, and then there's outlying parts not in the city to add to that. So you have a metropolitan area now around. 100,000 or more, and that was unheard of then. Uh, it was also largely rural. That's Dr. James Presley, a historian and Texarkana native. But this is a, a, a time of flux. It was in 1946. The war had ended the year before, so it was, I always think of Charles Dickens opening for A Tale of Two Cities is the worst of times and the best of times. It was the best of times in that the war was over and people were, you know, trying to get back to normal and, and having peace and maybe prosperity, at least they were hoping for it. They would go away from the rigors of war. And then it was the worst of time because there was uncertainty everywhere you looked. Both the Texas and Arkansas sides of Texarkana saw massive growth during and after World War II. That's mostly thanks to the Red River Army Depot, which stored military supplies and repaired tanks. It's still the area's largest employer. Texarkana sits at the junction of several major railroad lines. That meant plenty of people passed through Texarkana on passenger trains, sometimes stopping to stay the night. The city's nightlife boomed, especially on the weekends. Hotel Grimm was the largest and most luxurious hotel in Texarkana. It would eventually attract notorious guests like Marilyn Monroe, Elvis Presley, and even Bonnie and Clyde. Its marble floors, ornate ceilings, and its enormous glass chandelier stood out against the city's rustic small town feel. A sign reading Hotel Grimm stretched across the roof in glowing cursive letters above downtown Texarkana's cobblestone roads and brick buildings. On weekends, teenagers flocked to the Paramount Theater to catch the latest black and white movie. Stretches of stores and restaurants lined the streets. Prohibition had been repealed in 1933, and Texas left decisions on alcohol sales up to its counties. It was complicated. A county could go dry, meaning alcohol sales were banned, or wet, meaning alcohol sales were allowed, or a combination of the two allowed with special permits. Bowie County, where Texarkana resides, went dry, but they left beer sales up to smaller individual sections of the county, much to the delight of Texarkana's residents. So Texarkana's nightlife flourished, especially after World War II. The servicemen came home to places like the Cuban Saloon or the Plantation Club, or the most popular of all, Club Dallas, which sat just outside the city. 
Club Dallas stayed open seven days a week and advertised air conditioning, a full supper menu, and multiple shows a night. With the war over, Texarkana residents felt that things might finally get back to normal. Or at least, that's what they hoped. On Friday, February 22, 1946, Jimmy Hollis and Mary Jean Leary went on a double date at the Paramount Theater. They purchased tickets to see the new black-and-white thriller movie Three Strangers. The couple snuggled into their seats in the dark theater. They watched the characters on the screen gamble, lie, and murder their way to fame and fortune. It may sound cliche, but it really was just a typical Friday night for Jimmy and Mary Jean. They were a young couple getting to know each other. The only fear they felt was from the thriller they just watched. Neither of them could have been prepared for the night that awaited them. After this night, there would be no more late night movie showings. A curfew would attempt to keep teenagers inside after sundown, and the city of Texarkana would be flooded with fear. Hi, my name's Peyton Sims. Welcome to season two of Devilish Deeds. This season, I'll tell you the story of the Texarkana Phantom Killer, who committed a series of murders in 1946. It's a case that's baffled investigators for nearly 80 years. At one point, the Texas Department of Public Safety even called it the number one unsolved murder case in Texas history. This past summer, I graduated from the University of Texas at Austin with my bachelor's in journalism. In 2021, I moved to Austin for college from my hometown of Texarkana, on the Texas side of the border. I've grown up hearing about this case. When you live in a town where something this terrible happened, it comes up in conversation constantly. It's something of a Texas legend. And over time, the story has become larger than life. It's even been fictionalized. If you've seen the popular 1976 horror movie, The Town That Dreaded Sundown, you probably know a little bit about this case. But I wouldn't rely too heavily on that movie for factual information. There are even online communities dedicated to solving this case. In 2020, the FBI released more than 1,100 pages of archival documents about the murders. And yes, I'll tell you right off the bat that these murders are unsolved. So if you're looking for conclusive answers, you won't get them here. It's tough to put together the details of a story from almost a century ago, even if it did happen in my hometown. But throughout this podcast, you'll hear interviews with investigators, family members of victims, and a best-selling author who's an expert on the case. In this series, I want to shine light on the victims, whose names have largely been lost to history. I also want to separate fact from fiction and try to share the true story of the Phantom Killer, or as much of it as I could piece together. Many of the details in this story are gruesome, but I share them in an effort to accurately portray what each of these victims went through. of February 22nd, 1946, seemed just like any other night. The young couple who went to the movies had been seeing each other for a while. Mary Jean was a petite 19-year-old with dark hair that matched her eyes. Jimmy was 25 and much taller, with dark hair and glasses. When they began dating, Jimmy and Mary Jean were both going through divorces. They both got married young. This was common back then. Young brides liked to have someone to write to while the men were deployed in World War II. But these wartime relationships often didn't last very long after their spouses returned from war, and many ended in divorce. Jimmy and Mary Jean were both looking to start dating again, so they decided to get to know each other. By all accounts, they were happy together. They were even talking about marriage. 
even though the ink on their divorce papers had barely dried. As Jimmy and Mary Jean planned their date to see a movie at the Paramount Theater, they had an unexpected double date with Jimmy's shy brother, Bob. Bob couldn't stop talking about a girl who worked at a local drugstore. It was obvious he had a crush on her. But he was too afraid to ask her out on his own. So the much more outgoing Jimmy asked her to join them for a double date at the movies. Since Jimmy didn't own a car, he borrowed his brother's old gray Chevy to pick up Mary Jean. They enjoyed the movie, but the night had come to an end. Bob's date had a curfew. Jimmy dropped her off, then dropped Bob off at home. But Jimmy and Mary Jean didn't need to be home just yet. He wanted some extra time with her. So the two of them went for a drive. That Friday night in 1946, Jimmy drove along some quiet country roads in a rural area just north of Texarkana. This was a popular activity for young couples. These dark roads provided privacy for couples to get to know each other. Jimmy parked along the road with no other cars in sight. The couple sat in the car, chatting and laughing. Jimmy then sang to Mary Jean. The only light they could see came from their headlights in the nearly full moon. Finally, Jimmy and Mary Jean had some quality time together. They were completely alone with each other for the first time that night. Or so they thought. Dr. James Presley, the historian you heard from earlier, wrote a book about the Phantom Killer in 2014. In it, he wrote that Jimmy left Mary Jean in the car to go gaze at the Texas night sky. Then, Interrupting his peaceful moment, a bright beam of light startled him. A tall, young-looking man stood in front of Jimmy. The man shined the flashlight directly at Jimmy's face. Behind the flashlight, Jimmy could see the barrel of a pistol. He couldn't make out the man's face, but Mary Jean would later say she saw him wearing a mask that resembled a burlap sack or a pillowcase over his head. The man barked orders and cursed at him. He demanded Jimmy to take off his pants. Jimmy was confused. He tried to convince the man that this must be a big misunderstanding. Maybe he had the wrong guy. The man told Jimmy that he didn't want to kill him, so he should do as he says and take off his pants. Mary Jean, who was still in the car, begged Jimmy to obey the man's orders. So he did. Maybe it would keep him from getting hurt. Maybe the man just wanted to rob him. The gunman moved quickly. He struck Jimmy over the head, once then twice with a blunt object. Investigators would never determine the exact weapon, but they thought it could have been an iron pipe or the barrel of a pistol. The force of the blow knocked off Jimmy's glasses. He crumpled his skull cracking against the ground. The attacker hit Jimmy again and began stomping on him. Jimmy's niece, Diana Hollis, talked to me about what her uncle went through. When he was jumping on uh, Jimmy's chest, he said he had some kind of cleats on. A terrified Mary Jean watched from inside the car as the man attacked Jimmy. She heard the sound of Jimmy's skull cracking as it hit the ground. She later told police it was so loud, she thought it was a gunshot. Jimmy was unconscious on the ground. Mary Jean was now alone with the attacker. She got out of the car, thinking maybe he wanted money. She grabbed Jimmy's wallet out of the pants he'd just taken off. She tried to offer it to the man. Anything to get him to stop. But he didn't want any money. He hit Mary Jean on the head with the same blunt object. And then, he ordered her to run. Jimmy was still badly injured on the ground, and there was no one around for miles. The idea of running on the dirt road in high heels seemed impossible. 
But then the man began to stomp on Jimmy again. Mary Jean heard Jimmy groan in pain. She began to run. Mary Jean saw a parked car on the road and thought she might have found help. But the car was empty. So she kept running. She soon realized the attacker had not let her run off and was instead chasing her. He caught up to her quickly. He asked her, why was she running? Mary Jean was confused. She told him she ran because he told her to. He taunted her and called her a liar. The description of what happened next is extremely graphic and includes an account of sexual assault. You can skip ahead about a minute to avoid these details. Mary Jean froze in fear and the man hit her with a blunt object again. He held her down and sexually assaulted her with the barrel of the pistol. The abuse was so painful and traumatic that once Mary Jean managed to stand on her feet, she begged her attacker to kill her. Mary Jean couldn't remember much of what happened after that. That's common when people go through a traumatic experience. Here's Diana Hollis, Jimmy's niece again. While he was busy with Mary Jean, Uncle Jimmy was going in and out of consciousness. After the assault, the masked man fled the scene. But Mary Jean kept running. She ran until she saw a nearby house, where she banged on the door, begging for help. The man who answered the door looked confused. But... He listened to Mary Jean's story and called the police. While Mary Jean was looking for help, Jimmy slowly regained consciousness. He laid on the ground next to the car, looking around. He could no longer see his attacker. He felt foggy and disoriented from the head injury. He didn't even know if he could get up. Here's Jimmy's niece, Diana, again. Jimmy said he was able to crawl a ways to where the, you know, a street was, not a regular highway street, but, you know, just like a dirt road, was, and um, try to get some help from somebody that might be passing by. And the car did pass by and stopped. And Uncle Jimmy thought, wow, you know, here I am in my underwear, and that's all, and beat half to death. Who would stop and help me looking like this? You know, they'd be scared. He flagged the car down for help anyway. He couldn't afford to feel embarrassed about not having pants on when he was this badly injured. Anyway, the guy stopped, and Uncle Jimmy asked him if he could help him. He needed to get to a hospital. And uh, the guy said, Get on in, but don't get any blood in my car. And he said that he was thinking, uh oh, that sounds like the guy's voice that just, you know, was attacking them. So he thought it might be him. Anyway, sirens started coming about that time, and so he didn't get in the car. He didn't have to. Uh, and then the car drove off when he saw, you know, somebody else coming. Diana says the driver offered Jimmy a ride, but Dr. Presley wrote that the man driving the car had a woman in the passenger seat and refused to give Jimmy a ride. But the driver did promise to call an ambulance when he got to a phone. But an ambulance and a police officer showed up while the driver was still talking to Jimmy. The police officer talked to the driver while the medic took Jimmy to a Texarkana hospital. Mary Jean could see the scene from the house she'd run to for help. A police car took her to the hospital. And they took care of him and took him to the hospital. He stayed in a coma for a long time. Soon, the crime scene was crawling with investigators. Bowie County Sheriff Bill Presley and three other officers began following some fresh tire tracks in the dirt road. They thought maybe the attacker had driven past the same house that Mary Jean ran to for help. This could mean the attacker followed Mary Jean as she ran away. And James Presley wrote in his book that Jimmy even wondered if the driver he spoke to could have been the attacker. But he figured that wasn't the case. 
since the driver had a woman with him. Dr. Presley writes that police were never able to track down the driver after that night. Investigators questioned Mary Jean, who said she hadn't seen the man's face, but that she'd never forget his voice. She called it mean. She said she thought he was a black man with a light complexion, but that description was just based on her interpretation of the man's voice, since she said he wore a mask. The police weren't sure how accurate her account was. They had very few leads. The attacker had disappeared into thin air. I met Dr. Presley, the author of the book The Phantom Killer, for the first time in May of 2022. Prior to meeting him, we emailed back and forth for a while. Initially, I was even a little intimidated. After all, he is an expert on the case. He was the first person I interviewed for this podcast, and I talked to him in Texarkana only two days after I wrapped up my spring semester at college. He's incredibly smart and kind, and every other source I eventually talked to praised Presley's work. So I have a few few friends in town, but uh, I uh, and Jim I've known for quite a while, of course. Have you you have interviewed him or not? Uh, no? Yes, I did. I'm actually going to meet up with him again tomorrow. He's going to help with another interview. Good, good. Well, he he knows everything. And I never did talk with Jim Presley. I just commuted. I emailed him and back and forth, and mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> I've known him for many many years. I know when James Presley when he interviewed me talked, and we kind of recall some of the things. You know, I had heard of it g growing up, you know, that it had happened. James has got all kind of information, and he had a lot of research, and he had a lot of research on my family that I, you know, he knew things that I didn't even know. And when I met Dr. Presley in person, I instantly felt welcome. Dr. Presley lives with his wife in a neighborhood that's within walking distance of Spring Lake Park. He's been around Texarkana for a while. He wore a tucked-in button-up shirt when he shook my hand and welcomed me in. His voice was soft yet patient. It looked like he dressed up for an interview. The interior of his Texarkana home gave off a 1950s feel. The kitchen walls were covered in art, embroidered flowers and kittens, and the occasional Christian cross. I also noticed an impressive collection of teacups and kettles. And in the living room, the couch looked like it was more for decoration than sitting. He even had copies of his own books scattered on shelves throughout his home. You can tell he's proud of his work. As I started to set up our recording equipment on his kitchen table, Dr. Pressey rifled through laid out papers, making notes of important things to mention in his interview with me. So now, if you're ready, I could go ahead and start asking a couple of questions. Okay, okay shoot. <laughs> <coughs> no, no, don't shoot. <laughs> We're in the wrong topic. Dr. Presley's a big history buff. Like me, he moved out of Texarkana as a teenager and headed to Austin. But before he moved over five hours away, he hung around Texarkana a bit longer after high school. Despite receiving a scholarship to UT Austin, he decided to stay in Texarkana a little longer and enrolled in community college. A year later in 1947, he became a young reporter at the Texarkana Gazette. Years later, he went on to get his degree in history from UT, the same university I graduated from. Then he got his master's and PhD in history, so he's used to doing a lot of research. That's part of the reason he dug into this case. So uh, whether that prepared me for this, I don't know. Yeah. It, it did in a way because it was a, a major undertaking. And so, you know, that adds up. When the attack took place in 1946, Dr. Presley was getting ready to graduate high school. He lived eight miles outside of Texarkana in a rural area. He said after the attack, everyone in town was on edge, including himself. It was about a mile or two of dirt road. And you can imagine at that time, uh, you never knew where this guy was going to strike next. So, uh, as it happened, I was an only child, and my father, for much of that time, was working swing shift, which meant he was not home until after midnight. 
So my mother and I were alone with the phantom loose in the, who knows where, maybe, maybe beyond the, the bush over there, who knows? But uh, we uh, always kept a gun handy and uh, I always felt relieved when my father got in. Dr. Presley writes in his book that Texarkana was far from a sleepy little town. Like I've already told you, it had a busy social scene, especially after the war, and there was no shortage of violent crime. But I was just a, you know, bare teenager then, and uh, some of the older older kids had, I'm sure, had different experiences, but. Uh, the only thing I remember on that time is, is it was a scary time. The morning after the attack, news spread fast throughout Texarkana and throughout the country. Even the New York Daily News wrote about it. The headline the next day read, Masked Man Beats Texarkanian and Girl. The town was desperate for answers, but the police had very few leads. Dr. Presley's uncle, Bill Presley was the Bowie County Sheriff at the time, so he was closer to the action than most people in Texarkana. But that didn't mean that Dr. Presley had any more details than the general public. Well, we didn't have any close insights then because <laughs> he himself didn't know, the law enforcement people didn't know what was going on as far as who, who the identity of the perpetrator was. Jimmy Hollis's niece, Diana, so they even questioned Jimmy's dad, as well as his brother, who went on the double date to the movies. They arrested or collected Daddy, Bob Hollis, and Bob Hollis, and took him down to the police station and questioned him for hours and hours and hours and accused him of doing it. And Daddy was really mad about that, and I'm sure Bob was too, because Jimmy was very... Um, ill at that time, you know, being in a coma and being beat so badly. Meanwhile, Jimmy and Mary Jean were recovering in the hospital. Mary Jean had deep cuts on her head. Her wounds required eight stitches, but Jimmy's injuries were much worse. The attack left him with three different skull fractures. He was hospitalized for 15 days. Doctors didn't know whether he would make it. Law enforcement officers desperately searched for answers. But the only two witnesses to the crime were still recovering from their injuries. And their stories didn't line up. The day after the attack, Mary Jean specifically told police that their attacker was a light-skinned black man. But Jimmy felt confident that he'd seen a tanned white man. It's important to note that this is the 1940s in the South. Racial profiling was common. While the two disagreed on the man's race, they did agree that he was about six feet tall and he looked terrifying. As I said, Jimmy didn't remember seeing a mask, but Mary Jean said she did. Another point to note is that when someone undergoes a traumatic event, memory loss is incredibly common. Doctors call this dissociative amnesia. Trauma or stress can make it difficult to recall specific moments or personal information even things that seemed impossible to forget. It's possible this is why law enforcement got conflicting stories from the two victims. Plus, the attack happened at night. It's totally possible that they just didn't see their attacker clearly. For a while, law enforcement thought that the couple might have known their attacker. And with their conflicting theories, that made police think the couple were a part of a cover-up. The police began to mistrust Mary Jean. At the time, Police held racial stereotypes about how a black attacker would operate versus a white attacker. Based on that, they doubted Mary Jean's memories of the attacker being black. This type of thinking by investigators was inaccurate, but police work in the 40s had a long way to go. Police also considered Jimmy and Mary Jean's relationship status. They were both technically still married to other people when they started seeing each other. Maybe this attack was some kind of retaliation for their presumed infidelity. Maybe Mary Jean's soon-to-be ex-husband was feeling jealous. Or maybe the attacker was someone else Mary Jean was dating. But 
Mary Jean said there was no way the attacker was someone she was seeing. And her estranged husband was living 80 miles away in Arkansas at the time. So it couldn't have been him. Investigators also thought maybe it was a case of mistaken identity. And Jimmy and Mary Jean had never been the intended victims. Maybe they were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. According to Dr. Presley's book, police questioned Jimmy in his apartment shortly after he got out of the hospital. On March 20th, 1946, nearly a month after the attack, Jimmy told the police, quote, That man's dangerous. The next one he gets a hold of will be killed. Evidently, he thought he killed me that night. I know he was crazy. The crazy things he said. I know his mind was warped. After the attack, neither Jimmy nor Mary Jean were ever the same. Mary Jean recovered physically, but Jimmy had a tougher time. He couldn't work for six months. He had a large scar on his face, but the mental toll of the attacks on both of them was even worse than the physical damage. Jimmy's divorce was finalized in March of 1946, when he was still in the hospital. Mary Jean's was finalized the following month. By then, Mary Jean had moved to Oklahoma, and Jimmy visited her there. Here's Dr. Presley. I think he was interested in marrying Mary Jean, Mary Jean uh, Larry after her divorce because he did go up to Oklahoma where she had fled to stay with the aunt and uncle after this horrible experience. But they couldn't make it work. They had too much emotional trauma after the incident. And perhaps being in each other's company was a reminder of the brutal events they barely survived together. Here's Jimmy's niece, Diana, again. I think they really loved each other, but what, you know, what happened that night that just changed everything? You know, they were both in a situation of post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, I'm sure. Even in Oklahoma, over 400 miles from where the attack took place, Mary Jean feared her attacker would find her. She told police that she would never forget his voice for as long as she lived. It always rang in her ears. Jimmy and Mary Jean never got married. They went their separate ways and did their best to move on from each other and forget what happened that February night on Lover's Lane in Texarkana. A year before the attack, Jimmy Hollis had returned from serving overseas in World War II. Out of the family members I talked to, everyone described Jimmy as a likable man. He was nice to everyone, he was a devout Christian, and he loved to dance and sing. Jimmy loved to dance and he loved it, and he would sing at those things too, so. And when we were at his house, we didn't make it to church one time, so he, he made us have church at home, and we thought we were gonna get to skip, but no, he wouldn't let us. Um, one of his girls played the piano and we had to sing and then he was the preacher that day and preached us a sermon. That's Diana Hollis again. Her father was Bub, the brother who went on the double date with Jimmy and Mary Jean. Bub married the woman from the drugstore that he went on that first date with. She'd later become Diana's mother. Her parents felt a lot of guilt for what happened to Jimmy and Mary Jean but they were also very grateful they had been dropped off before the attack. Well, they felt awful, you know, for Jimmy and Mary Jean. They were scared to death, and they were so happy, you know, that their stop came came first, you know, for them to get out of the car and go home. They let Mom off, and then they, you know, dropped Daddy off. Diana told me that as much as Jimmy wanted to forget that night, every now and then, Reminders of it would haunt him. As far as we know, the attacker never fired a gun that night. But Diana told me that one of her uncle's triggers was the sound of a gun firing. Jimmy, he was very gun shy, I guess you could say, after that. You know, he couldn't, a firework would go off, you know, and it, he would jump four feet. You know, the trauma from that was always right under the surface. While Diana's point could be true, it's important to note that Jimmy also could be having trauma from the war. 
Regardless, Jimmy tried his best to put the attack behind him. With the cops still investigating the crime, Jimmy moved about 70 miles away to Shreveport, Louisiana, by himself to start a new life and take a job at a gas company. Then, he met a woman named Addie. That's why I'm here. He, when he got out of the hospital after being in the hospital a couple of weeks, he moved to Shreveport and met my mother, and, and that's why I'm here. If he hadn't attacked my father at the time, I would have never been born. That's Jimmy and Addie's son, David Hollis. Jimmy and Addie got married the year after Jimmy moved to Shreveport. But before David and his twin sister were born, Jimmy and Addie got a divorce. Jimmy didn't know Addie was pregnant. Growing up, David didn't have a relationship with his father. He didn't meet him until he was 22 years old. I did not really know my father. He left, they got a divorce before we were born. And uh, after we got married, we've only, we got married March 6, 70. We only married 52 years. And uh, he called me uh, a couple years after we got married. And we went up there in 73 and I met him for the first time and ever talked to him in 73 on our way to New York City for a vacation. And uh, he'd remarried, had five children, but he lived in Fairfax, Jim. He told me how nice Jimmy was when he first met him. He didn't seem to hold a grudge against his father, who remained out of touch for so many years. Despite David only meeting Jimmy for the first time in 1973, he knew about the attack, and he's always been curious about what actually happened. When Dr. Presley was writing his book, he also talked with David. While I was talking with him in his home, I kept thinking about how we were only a short walk away from where his father and Mary Jean were attacked. I also spoke to one of Jimmy's other sons, James, who was born in Jimmy's third marriage. James was clueless about his father's life prior to his birth. He didn't even know that his half-brother David Hollis existed until he was 25 years old. I thought I was his first son, turns out. He'd been married two times before he married my mom. I didn't know any of that until after, until he died. 1975, it, it came out and uh, I met uh, really, he always called me his number one son, but he actually had a set of twins, uh, a male and a female, and the male came to the funeral, David. And that's the first time I met him. James rarely talked with his father about the attack. I think he was, uh, pretty private about it since it was such a, a bad a bad deal for him. You know, he almost died, cracked his skull with a pipe. He was really a good father, you know? I mean, he he was uh, he was real active with, you know, five kids and, and being married and working at NASA. He was very active. He took his campaign and did all this stuff. So I didn't, I didn't see it uh, impacting uh, him being a father too much, you know, in my perspective. Weeks passed after the attack, and law enforcement still didn't have any leads. But people trusted Sheriff Bill Presley. Sheriff Presley wasn't the larger-than-life Texas sheriff you might be picturing. He was a smaller guy, and he didn't care much for violence. He could take care of himself with or without a gun. He didn't need a gun. If it says anything about him, his nephew, Dr. Presley, told me the only time the sheriff ever used his gun was to defend himself against, quote, a crazed drunk man. But he'd grown up in, uh, in rural parts of a neighborhood called Red Springs, which is where I grew up, but of course, decades later. And uh, my dad used to tell stories about when they'd go to dances in. And I got the opinion that uh, they went to dances not to dance, but to fight. So here was this little guy who would uh, participate in a number of those fights. and. Uh, and almost everyone who grew up there had. So he was not uh, easily cowed. In fact, his daughter, Billy, uh, told me that he'd only, he didn't like to carry a gun. A lot of the law would have, it's be almost tilted over to one side from the heavy hardware on their hip and said he kept uh, is on the, on the uh, seat, in the car seat, handy if he needed it. So you only remember one time he'd used it. It's when a belligerent grunt, the big guy, come up and said, you little so-and-so, you're not going to take me in. And uh, Bill took him in. So he, he was uh, capable. 
Dr. Presley told me his dad and his uncle were close, but he hadn't seen that much of his uncle Bill until after the attacks. Sheriff Presley had a hard life. Bill had had, he lost his wife and his uh, oldest daughter, older daughter, in a car accident. A drunken driver had intentionally driven over the, crashed into their pickup truck. And his wife and uh, daughter had died, so he had lived with him, his mother, my grandmother, and his uh, surviving daughter, who was a young teenager and barely a teenager, I think. And uh, so he had them staying overnight at other at friends, relatives' places, you know, people staying with him one way or way, because he would be gone sometimes almost all night. Sheriff Presley, a mild-mannered man with a good reputation, was well-suited for his job. But he was baffled by this case. What the police didn't know then was that this wasn't a crime of passion or a lover's quarrel. Something more sinister was stalking the town of Texarkana. Serial killers kill strangers. Rarely will they find anyone they know because they don't want to be tracked they know the police first are going to look for who did this place, this victim know. On Saturday night of March 23rd, 1946, almost exactly a month after the attack on Jimmy and Mary Jean, another young couple is looking forward to a dinner date and movie. The sun set over Texarkana, and just like Jimmy and Mary Jean, the couple didn't want the night to end. And just like Jimmy and Mary Jean, the two of them decided to take a drive to a quiet country road where darkness awaited them. Next on season two of Devilish Deeds. Nothing like this had happened before. The night before he was murdered, he had dinner with my, my mom and dad in Texarkana and, um, and um, that was the last they, they saw of him. This season of Devilish Deeds was reported, produced, and hosted by me, Peyton Sims. The executive producer is Katie Pinkshikautka. Katie also did the editing and sound design for this podcast, with editing assistance from Sewa Oliveras. The associate producers are Jade Emerson, Aurora Berry, and Liv Gamble. I'd also like to thank Dr. James Presley for allowing me to reference his best-selling book, The Phantom Killer, throughout this podcast. Because of his diligent research, all five episodes of this season were possible. I'd like to say a special thanks to my boyfriend, Asad Malik. He heard me mention in a couple episodes. He not only read over some of the first drafts of my scripts, but he also helped produce a promotional video. The Drag's marketing and communications manager, Sophia Vargas Karam. Alexa Georgelos designed the cover art, and I took the photo. The Drag is an audio production house within Texas Student Media at the Moody College of Communication at the University of Texas at Austin. Special thanks to Robert Quigley, Rachel Davis Mercy, and Gerald Johnson. The Drag is a nonprofit educational program that gives students like me hands on audio storytelling experience. If you want to support our work and help us create podcasts like this one, visit thedragaudio.com/slash donate.